やってくれますね目が<笑>あれあれねロックヘアへのロスチャイル<笑>今は最近この方<笑>あ常連っていいんだねさあ親友だあれねこれあ六十年代の<笑>はいアンポトーソンビュートあ大会社のね、日本向けには2010円。国門系のどう言えてもらった。国門系の聞きたいよ。これはあれだビフアバーグの公式会合。毎年一回。これを公表したけ。急いでこの内容。浅井さん怒ってたのか。ホールだ。なんで報道しないのみんな見てよ。これね。メインさんの本で知ったんですね。あんまり聞かない。あの、一人で考えてて。ああ、いろいろ言ってたね。権威なかったでしょ。これさ、あれだ。これ、どうぞ。クーハーだとおっしゃるけど、最近解釈が。クーハー、B、ベルハー、そして、ネッティングアーズのビルダーバーのグルーですごいですよこれねこれはこの時点で日本にいたのは、やめるのは海外、やめる、ソニーとバーニーだと。ね、かわいいお写真だ。だね、バレてはさ、平安神宮修具、平安神宮空別上がった。極端勢力がさ、これにもいいと思う。いつは大変ですか最近はみんな小さい。なんですよ、やっぱりイラチ、加害者が。隠蔽者だと。あれは日本政府、社会政府だと。ああいうこと、見えない。俺もこれ、最近見つけたよ。何年俺たち、去年発覚した。去年や日本向けに俺が、新山の子の四国なんかを言うし。塩崎さんの引退騒動とかね。あいつはい、三極トイレとか反セミティック法監視は適用対象だと実は私はブラックを使います今レッドに
companies to serve the digital revolution is to build trust with their customers and to build trust with their employees. Uh, one of the ways in which companies can do that is to have frank conversations with the workforce, to sit down with workers and their unions and to say, look, here's the challenges that we're facing. But importantly, to ask them, how can we best get there? Because all too often, a lot of those solutions that a company can put in place that will make a real difference, the employees know the answer to that. I think we've been able to have a dialogue on a lot of the 
that are more concerned to all of us. Where are we going on the climate issues? How is the digital transformation going? What is the security really going to look like in the digital world? Where is Russia heading? What are the Americans up to? What will be the consequences of Brexit? So virtually all of the issues that are topic of concern to us Europeans at the moment have been on the agenda in Europe, particularly in Stockholm. And then I think we have also been enjoying the company of this uh, very diverse, very interesting and increasingly young group that is the Trident Commission Uh, understanding no how to collaborate with each other and with this 
uh, world is moving uh, towards uh, a circular economy. It's a necessity. And when uh, you look at uh, water scarcity, when you look at uh, waste pollution, uh, everybody is now aware of that if we want to make a conciliation between uh, the, the planet for our children and uh, economic development, we need to move towards uh, a circular economy and by education, by uh, innovation, by a different way of doing business, both for um, citizens and also by companies, uh, we will make this move which will uh, help us collectively to have uh, a planet uh, great again. Yeah, it's possible to be had in the discussion. Uh, 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 uh,
moving across much of the uh, western world uh, are anchored in the very deep changes that have been swirling beneath our democracies that have been coming for many years and still have a long way uh, to run. They relate to uh, strong feelings of distrust in the political system, uh, widespread fears over the perceived destruction of ways of life, national identity, big worries over deprivation, the way in which the economic settlement is playing out, and weakening bonds between the mainstream parties and ordinary voters. Those four currents uh, have been with us for a very long time, before the Great Recession, before the arrival of Facebook and Twitter and Big Tech, uh, but they are now producing very substantive political uh, and they will continue and we also like to express substantive political effects. It has to feel that their nations and communities are secure uh, and have strong and robust uh, external uh, borders. And it also, over the long term, needs to provide uh, a, an economic system that ensures that everybody feels that they are uh, relatively uh, uh, getting the gains and the benefits that other groups from society uh, are getting uh, as well. Uh, very big challenges and no clear answer uh, as to now. What I got home told on the show. The concepts and the four definitions, which are so vital to support any policy development process, are also something AI and cyber security. Yeah, by this. Uh, very competitive. 
and his export oriented uh, to is very successful on world markets. But most of the companies are not only delivering cars in other parts of the world, they are also producing cars in those parts of the world, whether it's in the United States, whether it's in China, whether it's in Asia, where they have a lot of success. That means in the long run, free trade is always the best solution for economy and for the country. Uh, we want uh, uh, to safeguard jobs uh, and prosperity. Thank you very much. Uh, may I begin by expressing uh, praise uh, for very good work and uh, good morning from On behalf of Pakistan regime, Quantum leader is a new paradigm leader who realizes that the world is holistic. All things, all people, all problems are interconnected. There are no others. There is no separation. Uh, I am you, you are me. Uh, thus, a quantum leader would face, say, the problem of inequality very differently, or the problem of identity very differently. Because we are not separate, atomistic, isolated individuals, and our problems are not separate, isolated, and atomistic. A quantum leader is ethical, is moral, has compassion. A quantum leader is self-aware. A quantum leader celebrates diversity. A quantum leader asks fundamental questions. Uh, always questioning him or herself. Questioning assumptions, questioning the way things have been done, questioning the norm. Someone who lives at the edge of chaos, who shakes things up, who thrives on uncertainty, who thrives on chaos. Um, a quantum leader is filled with compassion. Uh, and a quantum leader feels called to be called to serve. Shell companies, these 
Para ah. Ah. Good afternoon. Two buttons. I apologize for that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mujahi, again. Sorry for, for, for the delay. Good morning and good afternoon to all the participants. Um, my name is Andras Kastelic. I'm a researcher at the University of Tech Tech. And I've been given the opportunity to moderate this first substantial panel of the event organized by Einstein and Yunus. already mentioned this session will introduce the key concepts of cybersecurity to sort of set the foundation, if you will, and uh, hopefully enable participants to follow for the rest of the sessions. Uh, session. I'm pleased uh, we have with us today um, Professor Asal, who is Associate Professor in the Department of Cybersecurity at Air University in Islamabad, and Dr. Samuel Dominion, who is a couple of organizational remarks. The speakers have each about 15 minutes to introduce us to the key cybersecurity concepts. They're going to address different, different, different aspects of these. Um, the remaining of the panel 
audience we are becoming more and more quantified, which means that each of us, but also sensors and autonomous devices, think about, for example, the Internet of Things, produce an enormous quantity of data each second. According to some estimates, by 2025, data produced in a year will be at least 175 これ、ね、ここに文句言った。だよ。ここ、ちょっとやる。なんで上級を遅いんだ。来たな。
組織やから。下っ端なの。わかりました。お互い下っ端なの。下っ端なの。森田の戦いだね。なんでいやあれなんブラジリアあーあー日本大作のメールにしましたなあどうするかしらロックヘラーズかしらおおおもたいしておもたいかたもかいしてなんか今のうんでいいじゃあ、新党白状したの。お前を拉致した加害者と認めた。
been to the EU, but also have been for beyond. What does it mean to be a featherless, two-legged, linguistically conscious creature born between? You will have to define what you mean by Europe and the European Union having its own army. I do not think Europe needs its own army for what I would qualify as the classical Article 5 NATO scenario, in other words, in the conflict with, uh, with Russia. But uh, Europe should definitely, uh, the European Union should definitely develop possibility to project half power without the United States of America. I can imagine a scenario in Northern Africa uh, where you have a combination of terrorism, uh, climate change, migration. It's an ungoverned part of Africa, large, uh, where Boko Haram meets Al-Qaeda, where Al-Qaeda meets Daesh. Uh, in other words, it's not impossible. Look at the French and what they did and are doing in Mali. That you would need to intervene militarily and then the second scenario, uh, virtual but not impossible, uh, when in the Balkans the demons of the past would raise again. Uh, and uh, we should not repeat the situation like we had in the 90s of the previous century, where finally Bill Clinton and the United States of America had to come in uh, to, to stabilize the situation. I would think about uh, the need for border protection, external border protection, with military means. You're a bit on the, on the border here between uh, the military and the military police, the gendarmerie in, uh, in, in, in French. In other words, uh, uh, if that is meant by President Macron and Charles Merkel with the European army, I can follow them. Uh, what we should not forget, uh, by the way, uh, is when you talk about European military intervention, that's why I like the qualification European army not, not much, is that there will always be national parliaments who will decide if those soldiers uh, will be sent into harm's way. So uh, uh, they will not, uh, I hope, talk about a European command and a European parliament which decides this goes to the heart of the sovereignty of nations and those nations will want to decide themselves. I see the way out uh, as, as presented by uh, President Macron of France, the European Intervention Initiative, where you can build coalitions of the willing outside the EU institutions, you can build coalitions of the willing, uh, which you will always need uh, uh, for such kind of military operations. The advantage of a coalition of the willing is that after Brexit, you can keep Great Britain on board, because they will not anymore be uh, a member of the European Union. At the same time, PESCO, the permanent structure cooperation, should of course continue, important project, but rather bureaucratic and rather cumbersome. Um, so that, that would be uh, my answer to the question, does Europe need its own army? Sometimes uh, relative to the 
Does the European Union need its own army? Well, here's what I think. Uh, the vision of a European army is actually a useful vision because it is good to know what the long-term goal might be. But is the European army something we can put together right now? No. And why not? First and foremost, because the European Union does not even have the mechanism to come up with clear political decisions and to speak with one voice in crisis. So the first step which we in the European Union need to take together is to change our decision-making process. We need to go from consensus to qualified majority voting. We need to learn that all of us, whether we are 27 or 28, will only be listened to, will only be respected, and can only be a military actor in the world if we speak with one voice. And that requires majority voting. So that's step number one. And the next steps are capabilities, and we will need to work on that also. And then we can think of the long-term vision of a European army. Say that 
particularly because when one looks at the figures regarding relocation of refugees across Europe, then one will realize that not enough has been done in that direction. And so one is led to the question, what kind of Europe do we want? Do we want a Europe where we all share the benefits of Europe, or do we also want a Europe where countries also share burdens? What can we do in order for the rights of the child? So I would like that to be made free from organization. And I can simply leave it with that and, and ask you, so what does it take and what can we do? Well, I can't tell you that first what I can talk about. So, my wife and I have been on a hundred city tour since January. And I've spoken to about 250,000 people over the course of the last in Australia, New Zealand, and throughout the US and Canada. Some in Europe, mostly in the UK and the Scandinavian countries, coming back here in March and April. Those three conditions, and then working to rectify them. The corollary of that is that it's almost inevitably the case that people find the meaning that sustains themselves oh, and that enables them to motivate them. It's not 
talk about. It's the doctrine that the individual is the sovereign foundation of the community. Yeah. 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 Y
Some people wonder why best practices in government haven't spread faster amongst the democracies. Uh, when you see, for example, that New Zealand has solved the problem of public finance, why doesn't everybody copy it? Why doesn't everybody copy the way that the South Koreans teach their kids mathematics? Why doesn't everybody copy the way the Swiss decentralize their politics? And I think part of the answer is that we don't really spend nearly enough time looking at what is best practice. I live in the United States, though I grew up in the United Kingdom. One hardly ever hears a reference to other countries' systems in the US debate on healthcare, except when somebody is making a completely uh, caricatured analysis of the way, say, Canada does things. So I think part of what we need to do is stress the need to look at best practice so that politicians and voters become more aware that there are solutions to most of the public policy problems. We just haven't tried them in many countries. On the other hand, I think there's one other side to this that one should forget. Sometimes you'll meet people who'll tell you, well, the Scandinavians have worked everything out, and Sweden, Finland, or Denmark has come up with the perfect solution to policy problems. That's often an argument people make on the left in the United States. But I don't think the solutions that the Swedes came up with in recent decades necessarily would work in a country as large as the United States. So let's look at best practice. Let's understand how the systems deliver the best results. But let's not pretend that one size is going to fit all. Part of the reason for the success of Western civilization, which is where democracy began, was the diversity of systems and the competition between them. I recently read that information is now the world's most consequential and contested duty. So, あ、<笑> あ、入れないと。あ、入れないね。だね、ほい、ですね。はい、見に行くわ、ここに。全世界の本、ヘミティック監修。で、韓国だよ。そう。イスラエル、ともあり。世界、ソニスキと。の監修でありました。あ、オ
。心は俺は。でも俺はね、俺は俺で。俺自体がビルマーマークで。メタリアさんね、あ、メイカさんもね、ちょっとさ、ところでイスラエルの関係者行ってます？行ってないよ。関心の主役だ。行ってるはずだよね。うん、だから南アメリカ共和国行ってない。いやらせやった。やらせやった。中原さんのアジアね、大変ね、安全保障協力会議、自民党、あれはアジア安全保障だよ。そうなのよ。うん、経済会議ね、ね結局は違ってね、ちょっと特殊なね、あ、経済会議ね、ダボスみたいな。はい、東北バラブ、一時のね、元からアブレイスウェル。ダボスの元がクラブ。名前とダボスのダメやったら。ああ、基本的に言ったら四国面白いから。面白いで、今度、本当やったな。ああ、大宮島の嘘パチがほとんどや。なんだでしょうね。多分。賠償金払わないのかなや別の事案だ払わされるあやっねあ多分どうやろうとはおないでなヤンマーがダメやったさあやっぱり急に長生まれた急に残念な会社役ほとんどはい、新日本人だ。ああ、選ぶとこっそり送ってるよさ。あれね、会社に別にいるよ。昨日とね、そう。ダメだよ。埼玉と栃木だった。昨日と消しちゃえば、ね、よかったよさ。おかしいと思って。オンラインで見せられてるね。あら、俺も残念ながら去年初めて来た。こんな簡単にあれで、一時終わりですよ。覚えましたさあ、あの、あの、初の、世界初のビルナーバグ、だいぶ公開した、そのトロントスター社、そのカナダのジャーナリスト、襲撃事件。さあ、こっちのが恐ろしいね。ちょっと知ってるか、知ってるかね、うん。だけど、うん、本当に暗殺だったよ。いやさあ、これが。いやはりなあなあんたいやはり大王のでしょう大王か大王当に四国やったなどうなってる東松山。報道された
何で寝た俺は最初からねエルナバーグのお父さんはあ知ってるかよ田中のお父さんも知ってるか俺知らずに世界を知るんだけどんな組織かわかるかスリアイドモサド DGSE とかね MI6 とか来るだろ本当に来るらしいなただ俺に関しては別、うん、それでえんな児玉よしを狙われた児、うん、玉よしをさかばう遅かった遅かった遅かったんかさベルアバーグをしゃべる予定だった4000円のインペーザーどうどうするんですかところがありましたさあありましたたまよ本当にちょっとしてるベンさんもしゃべってるよシロンっていうね巨大な超複共同体が来るぞ来るぞ公安調査場も来るぞ来るぞ本当に上演さあ、はい、なんか知ってるか知ってるかねあどんな恐ろしいかしら今、埼玉方面、戒厳令状態は、完成形態とぶつかっている。警察に何で関係ないのかどうでおかしいと思った。ああ俺は東京のデフォルトしてる。国はね、そういうのもね。さあ、新山に関しては入場初めて。実は私は、ねね、四国のね、そういいよな、こういうふうに言ったときに、まあ、日本に、ね、なぜ真っ白さん、俺が小さくなったか、本当、もし生きてたら俺100歳以上になったか。ビッグバン教会の日本総支部の本部は勝ってここやったそして皮肉なことに JIA のねそう避難先やとそう安保統制俺はもう立ちたって言ったそう俺は立ちたあの本当に58年もうすぐ帰りましたなこれダメだけどね短期ビザとか全然行ったね実はね俺の町のビザも全部捨てられてる、ね。ね、本
これがねこの短期間のさ圧力が麻痺状態じゃんだから言うとなんかおいこの証言したいなこんな年はあああのねやばくないアスカくらいあ本当にいろいろな汚れの国だけどゴミ級のようなスターバックスで長めにタイミングでこれから名刺透明になってこれから名前で本当に行動から優しく関係性はあるそうあいつるしだあれはなんて取りしめのさ。三曲のトリジュリー気づいたら本当にトニアやつだ。毎週にね、ベルアバウンドね、公式会を毎年一回放送してた。いわゆる海外のブラウザーのやつ。知らないですか、ベンジャミンです。海外のね、普通に英語でベルアバウンドに行くべきだ。出てきますよ、ね、残念ながら今はね、日本系の規制が強かったから、規制が強かった。英国ペディアみたいな。これも試しなきゃ残念ながら意味不明なのね、それだけの本気で。ね The future of digital transformation. I also presented the differences between the US, Europe, and China. How they are integrating artificial intelligence in the future of the world. これつないで交渉してるから気をつけてね、見てるか勘違いするね。毎年1回5月か6月の公開です、はい。開催します。それだけ。二子座の首脳会談。二子座の首脳会談。まあ、ユーザーは一緒に。そういうもんっていうか、この方、ビルダーバーグの方が。気づきますか
challenge. Everybody was in for pretty high on the things that the thing they train the colonists there really goes on pretty fast. They, um, they tell a story that people uh, want to believe. Course, a lot of the time they will appeal to anger, um, they'll appear to fear, and they'll appeal to hatred, a while. and they um, will and try and stop um, people thinking. They'll try and get it stuck so it will be a good job. Between the panda huggers and the panda huggers. That means that oh, yeah. for those of us who yeah, are trying to change the future, narratives on a daily basis, it's a much more complex challenge than just presenting the facts. You have to have the ability to tell the story. You have to find an emotion to appeal to, which will actually get people to think. Now, fortunately, there is a model of a story which works. If you think of the, te of the detective story, that's a story where you're putting together evidence and you're telling people this is what happens. And it appeals to a natural population. It appeals to curiosity, it appeals to problem solving. And so, a lot of the challenge is to get this information. これはやっぱり認めたパイの泣こえてきた時どうやったらやるのうわなんだか僕もんかじゃねえぐくなってるさあどうなってるんやコラボレーションということは人気やねんってことやね。ブラックおいブラックおい特攻したかおい。これマスクって言ったら本当に2016年の初めてやったな。
I got a few games. I need to focus. I can't tell you anything. No, I think he doesn't know how to do all this. I don't know. 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 So we to pay dimensions ten times and more about the fire and, and, and to make them new experience to reinforce um, so, uh, uh, in the uh, number of domains of uh, um, so I would it's say really franchise to watch as how the trilateral the Commonwealth government has grown the really along this way. that the trilateral is called trilateral because there is not um, only the new industry, the US, Mexico, uh, Canada, Australia's but also Europe um, and also Asia. And of course the whole of Asia at a global level is not only we confer our own values, democratic values, rule of law, human rights, and all that goes with the democratic society, we also reinforce the firm of values as regards multilateralism, international cooperation, in the best sense of the term. Also said that we would like to be more transparent than uh, we were before at the level of the trilateral as a whole, with a new initiative that we do, oh, yeah. in particular the idea of uh, having a uh, display of video to sum up some of the issues around the US, and also with the idea of uh, making known at the level of the trilateral nation all publications, articles, uh, interventions, books that would be displayed or published by the members of the Trilateral Commission. All this, of course, as part of transparency, yeah, right, uh, also as so part like of uh, being uh, more influential, if, uh, if uh, it is possible. We also uh, have given a mandate to the free chair to see in which direction we could be more proactive in terms of uh, communication, display of our ideas, for various forms. Is something which is very important and is one of the major conclusions of the, the uh, Trilateral Commission, which uh, took place in Paris. Years or so. Whereas Australia is here, uh, really at the far edge of the world, um, arguably, um, you know, one of one of the books I read when I first came down here by a former diplomat, uh, Alan Ginger, Hello, I'm Megan O'Sullivan. I am the new chair of the North America Group of the Trilateral Commission. I wanted to take this opportunity to say a few words about the commission and about our future. As you may know, the Trilateral Commission is a storied institution, an organization with 46 years of history. History of having an impact on big ideas, on bringing people together across different sectors and across three different geographies, that of North America, Europe, and Asia. But we are on the cusp of a, a new chapter, one that builds on that history, but really reorients ourselves and puts us in a position to make an impact in a very, very different world. And the reason why I have such confidence that the Commission can remake itself is because there is a need and the Commission is well suited to meet that need. And that need is quite simply that in this day and age, in these political landscapes, the need is simply for more organizations, more individuals, more entities to take up the mantle of defending a rules-based order, an order that values and is committed to democratic principles, ideas like free trade and human rights. And we also have a need for more ideas more ideas to help us tackle new challenges, or certainly challenges that are new to this generation. And there are many reasons why I think the trilateral organization is so well poised to meet this need. First and foremost, we are an organization that at its heart is a community of countries that share a common set of values, that share these commitments to these ideas about democracy, about free markets, uh, about the rule of law. And secondly, we have a membership that spans policy, business, and academia and media. And that allows 
us to bring minds together in experience to bear on problems that are no longer just the purview of one of those sectors. The things that need to be thought about today and where we need new solutions and prescriptions are ones that are the intersection of business and policy, whether it is the contributions that private sector organizations can make to combating climate change, whether it is figuring out the ideas that will drive the reform of capitalism, or whether it is understanding the impact of technology on our systems. All of these things need business, government, and others at the table to help with. Now, of course, to realize this potential for the trilateral organization to meet this need, we are going to have to do some things differently than we have in the past. First and foremost, we are going to have to recognize, as a group primarily of democracies, we need to spend some time looking at ourselves, looking internally, saying what's happening with our own institutions, what is the health of our own institutions, and how is that situation affecting our ability to cooperate across national lines and uh, deliver global problems to pressing global solutions. So we're spending more time talking about things like populism and the impact of technology on our own societies. Secondly, we've got to think about impact differently. Traditionally, we're an organization that has had impact based on the very nature of our relationships. We're an organization of people who have close ties to national governments, and often the ideas that we debate um, in private inform our own perspectives and inform our discussions and deliberations and conversations with people in positions of power. That will still be true, but today we need to think about having an impact on the broader debate. We no longer live in a world where governments are the only ones that can influence the future. In fact, increasingly, we have to think about other entities as being the real engines of change, and be that corporations or universities or even individuals. We need to think about how to shape the conversation, how to bring those groups in, uh, to have investment in and commitment to solutions, and we need to move ahead whether or not we're able to get our governments to agree with our prescriptions and recommendations. So in short, it's a really exciting time to be part of the Trilateral Commission. I'm deeply honored to be the new chair of the North America Group, and I look forward to working with all our members and my colleagues from other regions to realize this vision. Thank you. And Australia has been increasingly going to Washington or when they come here to Sydney, Canberra, um, bringing the big ideas and, and, and really agitating for uh, the U.S. to, to, to be... So I'm Jane Harmon, Harmon, and the question right is, what is the future of political parties? Uh, I can speak to the U.S. more than anywhere else. I was a member of our Congress for nine terms and left because it became so partisan and dysfunctional. Uh, at the Wilson Center, we study this, and there are some remedies to the problems. But bottom line, in the U.S., our tradition is two parties only. In Europe, there are multi-party uh, systems in most countries, and we're seeing the rise of populist parties. Uh, in the U.S., we have no populist party. We have a Republican Party that is now dominated by our president, and we have a Democratic Party where most of the noise is coming from the far left. What we don't have is anything to represent the center, and that is the challenge for the U.S. going forward. That is something I work on, and that is something that the Wilson Center uh, is hoping to improve because if we are to convey uh, at least uh, uh, a, a majority view in the United States essential to making our foreign policy and domestic policy effective, uh, we need to reach for the center so that we have both parties participate. And hopefully we'll advance that goal here at the Trilateral Commission.
strong in terms of uh, uh, leading them to respect its own rules as uh, uh, pro-Europeans would like to see. And uh, we can even see in uh, recent years, for example, a um, greater leniency in terms of uh, allowing <sighs> They uh, really unexpected uh, unity among the 27, also thanks to the skills uh, and determination of the chief negotiator, Michel Barnier. And uh, we are seeing how difficult it is for the Europeans to get in touch with the And this, in my view, should be also yeah, yeah. kept in mind by countries. nobody knows, which has given rise to endless conspiracy theories about the real nature of the conference and its members. Journalists who tried to find out have continued to be So, what exactly is the Bilderberg meeting that's supposed to be about? Well, originally the meeting was formed in 1954 in the Netherlands for the express purpose of promoting Atlanticism. This was basically a cooperative movement between the United States, Europe, to promote financial prosperity as well as to pull defense and international influence. Totally unsurprisingly, this meeting came just as the Cold War ramped in the second year, and countries around the world turned their side of the Russian Ukraine conflict. One of the founders of the Bilderberg Group was Joseph Redinger, who was the first Secretary General for the European Union, which led directly to the modern day European Union. So, effectively, the original intention of the Bilderberg Group was to join all the westernized countries of Europe with the hyper Western United States. How do we do this union work? We follow the stability and work of the treaty organization, NATO. The defense network and the Soviet Union provided a solid backing for Western leaders to work together. Today, although almost no details of what is specifically discussed behind closed doors are ever openly shared, a list of broad topics are provided to the public. In a June 2016 meeting, Germany included points about cybersecurity, energy and commodity prices, Russia and China, and the term precariat, which describes workers in jobs with no future security or long-term goals. These issues are likely going to be the most relevant for the global economy and security in the near future. We also know by home, and varies from about 120 to 150 attendees. This year's guest list was publicly revealed to include House figures such as former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, former CIA Director David Petraeus, Senator Lindsey Graham, billionaire Peter Thiel, and a large number of CEOs who compete as diverse as LinkedIn, the world, and Shell. What few things members of the conference are allowed to publicly discuss are bound to what is called the Chatham House Committee. No information shared from the meeting can be attributed to the person who said 
large grouping of the most powerful people in the world is not a simple fit check, and it's likely that more events are influenced by the results of the Bilderberg group. But at least the Bilderbergs have a publicized opinion. Other secretive conspiratorial groups, like you say the Illuminati, merely focus on favor. But does the Illuminati have more influence than most people think? Find out by watching this video. In recent years, the idea of a resurgence in surviving Illuminati order that is in control of world events through underlying iconography and ritualism has been a popular conspiracy theory. However, there is literally no evidence of the existence of this group nor any connection between current groups and the Bavarian Illuminati. Still, that exactly what the big one Thanks for watching Secret Daily. Don't forget to like and subscribe for new videos every day. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm fully back. It's a forum held every year where the rich and the powerful can meet and exchange ideas and secrets. Almost 130 politicians, bankers, and industrialists are attending this year's Bilderberg Group conference in the German city of Dresden. This year's attendees include the former head of the CIA and the IMF's chief, but just like every year, no reporters are allowed in. There are no minutes of meetings, no votes, and no policy statements, and participants are bound by what's known as the Chatham House Rule, which allows people to make use of the information they've received, but not reveal the identity or affiliation of the person who gave it to them. Now, for years, the agenda and list of attendees of Bilderberg was kept a secret. A list of discussion topics is now released, but it's extremely vague. We do, however, have the full list of people attending. Two prime ministers will be there, Mark Rutte from the Netherlands and Belgium's Charles Michel. And as we mentioned earlier, Christine Lagarde is attending. She's the head of the International Monetary Fund. Two former intelligence chiefs, John Sowers of MI6 and David Petraeus, who used to lead the CIA, will also be there. And the rest of the list is littered with influential businessmen and bankers, including the heads of Shell, HSBC, and Alphabet Inc., which is the holding company for Google. There are also around 10 journalists from major media organizations attending the meeting, but they can't report on it. Well, let's bring in our guests now. Joining us from Dresden on Skype is writer and journalist Charlie Skelton, who's covering the Bilderberg Conference for the Guardian newspaper. In London, we have the head of global affairs at Oxfam, Katie Wright, and from Middleburg in Holland, also on Skype, is Giles Park Smith, who's a professor of diplomatic history at the University of Leiden. Welcome to you all. Thank you for being on Inside Story. Charlie, Dresden, if I can start with you, there are many people, of course, who don't know what Bilderberg is. So, what actually happens when the world's most influential people get together? In the case of the uh, uh, yeah. uh, an yeah. three-day summit um, um, at which uh, the participants um, will sit down and, and be part of an extremely rigorously structured conference. Uh, and uh, and the, some of these participants will be from the world of uh, politics. So this year there are two prime ministers, four uh, finance uh, ministers, uh, uh, any number of other ministers uh, from around Europe. Um, there's uh, Christine Lagarde from the head of the IMF. Um, the, the list goes on. Extremely influential policy makers. And what they're doing is they're attending a conference which is 
let me bring in John Scott, who's uh, in, in Middleburg now. So a very vague agenda, John, is at this meeting. No resolutions are proposed. No votes are taken. No final communique is issued. What's the point of all this? Why is this meeting still so important today? Well, I think uh, economic, political, and financial needs. Oh, Jó, nem várnak ilyen. Na, így a kollégahontól, ahol nem szépen szépen.